This sermon is titled James chapter 4. Be enriched as you listen. Okay, are you ready to spend time in God's word? All right, so let's turn to the book of James. We are studying through uh James. Uh just to quickly review, we've um, finished four uh four messages. Today is the fourth message in the series. Quick to quickly review some of the things we have stated earlier. Uh James is um uh, possibly or most likely the earliest New Testament book to be written written by James who was the half brother of Jesus so he actually saw Jesus growing up uh we also said that you know initially James was an unbeliever he didn't believe uh in Jesus especially during his earthly ministry but he became a believer post the resurrection of Christ so that itself is a strong validation of uh, the resurrection of Christ James and the other brothers of Jesus half brothers of Jesus they all became believers post the resurrection in James chapter 1 so James is writing to the believers Jewish believers Jewish Christians who have been dispersed through and around the Mediterranean are uh, they going through a, a, a difficult time they've been displaced from their own home home base or home city they are scattered around uh they have to find jobs some are working very small jobs just trying to make it uh but they're all strong in their faith in Christ and so James is writing to address a lot of the issues and struggles they are facing and yet at the same time teaching how the christian faith is lived out in very simple practical ways in everyday life so james is a very practical book addressing and telling us how to live out faith in everyday life in chapter 1 you know james talks about of overcoming trials receiving wisdom from god overcoming temptation and what it what what does it mean to be a true believer in jesus how does it uh, uh, how do you how does how does it show out uh, in everyday life in chapter 2 uh, he was addressing faith and works that he was telling us look uh, if you have faith but you don't have corresponding expressions of doing something then that faith itself is meaningless so faith true bible faith is always expressed through what we do so he addresses doing good works but he also talks about he points to abraham and rahab saying look both of them had faith in god and they demonstrated their faith through what they did and so he tells us in james 2 that the works that we do the corresponding works that we do in line with our faith actually brings our faith to a place of maturity it brings our faith to a place where faith can produce in our lives so what must we do in for faith to produce or to be effective in our lives we need to act in line we need to have corresponding actions and the works we do causes faith to produce come to that maturity to be producing or be effective in our lives and he concludes James 2:26 he says faith without works is dead meaning it doesn't have any use it's lifeless chapter 3 a uh, quick review he says okay now here's another important thing uh, if you are really spiritual show that by taming your tongue by watching over your words he says James in the beginning of that chapter so we saw that and then he tells us you know okay he says okay here's the reason why i'm picking on that little member in your body because he says you know that little member it actually is very powerful and he gives us three comparisons he says you know it's like the rudder on the ship you know the little rudder de- decides or determines the direction of that ship at sea He says the tongue is also like the bit in the horse's mouth the horse is a very powerful animal but it's controlled and directed by that little bit in its mouth and then he says the tongue is like a little fire a forest fire a little fire can destroy a huge forest so he's giving us these three comparisons hope hopefully one of them or all of them will hit home and we say oh that's how important my words are you know the words may be cheap or easy but they actually guide and direct and determine the course life would take and so he says though our words set on fire 
the entire course of our lives. And he also draws a comparison, I mean, or he tells us about the impact of an evil tongue. He says an evil tongue sitting in our, in our body, it defiles the whole body. And this evil tongue is actually set on fire by hell. A tongue that's speaking evil things is actually receiving its fire or its inspiration from hell. And it sets on fire the course of the entire person's life. Now that's an evil tongue. But we say turn it around because the, uh, the converse is also true. A good tongue, a healthy tongue, a wholesome tongue is a blessing to the whole body. So let's say this with, together. My tongue is a blessing to my whole body. Right? So wholesome tongue. If you speak wholesome words, good words, healthy words, it blesses your whole body. And then he says, you know, so then we could say that a wholesome tongue is set on fire or is inspired by the word of God. That like, as we heard earlier, we say, because God has said, because he has said, we boldly say, right? So that's a wholesome tongue. It's speaking what God has said. And a wholesome tongue not only blesses your whole body, but your wholesome tongue sets on fire or it infuses your entire life with the blessing of God. An evil tongue is destructive. A wholesome tongue will bless, strengthen, and build up the entire course of your life. Are you all with me? And then he gives us one more comparison. He says, there's a spring. Bring forth salt water and fresh water. There's a fig tree. Bear figs and something else. So he says, even in nature, you understand that there is singularity. That means you're either good or bad. You're either fresh water or salt water. You either bear figs or something else. So he says, that's how our words must be. He says, we can't bless God and curse our brothers. Doesn't make sense. So you bless God, bless your brother too. So always speak blessing. That's, so that's where we stop. Are you all with me? So let's turn our Bibles now to James chapter 3. We're going to pick up from verse 13 because uh, we, uh, we stop there with verse 12. So James chapter 3. Now, after having spoken to us about the importance of our words and uh, our tongue, he tells us, you know, this is what true wisdom is. This is how you and I can say that we are walking with wisdom. So James 3, we will read verses 1, uh, 13 to 18. Please follow with me in your Bibles. Uh, the scriptures will also come up on the screen if you'd like to look at that. James 3, 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So here he is contrasting wisdom that comes from God and wisdom that is earthly, sensual, and demonic. That is, that is it's from a different source. So he's contrasting that. He says, how can you tell if you're actually walking in divine wisdom, the wisdom that comes from God, or is it earthly, are you, you know, motivated by earthly, something that's earthly, sensual, and demonic? How do you draw the distinction? How do you differentiate the two? So he says, you know, if there is somebody who is wise in understanding, let him show how. By all the PhDs, no. Let him show by his good 
conducts, that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. So if you are really wise in understanding, people will see it, people will see it in our manner of life, in how we live life. And what is it that one thing that he's pointing to? He's saying such a person will do his works, will do what he's doing with meekness, with humility. Because wisdom, as we will see, he mentions eight characteristics of divine wisdom. Wisdom, true wisdom from God, heavenly wisdom, one of his characteristics is meekness, walking in humility. So meekness is not weakness. Let's say that together. Meekness is not? In fact, the Bible says the meek will inherit the earth. I mean, it's actually, meekness is strength in disguise. The meek will inherit the earth. You're positioning yourself to conquer when you're walking in humility, when you're walking in meekness. So the Bible, so James is saying here, if a person is really wise in understanding, he's going to do his work, meekness of wisdom. He'll do it meekly. Now, this is very counterintuitive to the world. Because in the world, fake it to make it. Right? I mean, even if you don't have it, just fake it. <laughs> you know, like, you know, do it. Just show, like, pretend you got it, you know. Uh, so in the world, the, the world's philosophy is so different. Right? Pull the other person down. Knock him out. Now, when he's on the ground, make sure he goes six feet down before. <laughs> you know, so the world's wisdom is so different. But James is telling us, you know, if you, are, if you really are walking with wisdom and understanding, this is how it is. Your conduct will be bathed in meekness that is originating from true wisdom. You'll walk with meekness. You don't feel like I have to flaunt myself, my achievements, my successes. I don't have to parade myself around here. God will do it. Because the Bible always says, those who honor me, I will honor. When God puts honor on your life, no man, no devil can stop it. Amen? So that's why you're not afraid to walk in meekness. You don't have to be persuaded by the trends of the world. You choose to live by ancient truth because you know that when you walk in meekness, when God puts his honor on your life, nobody on earth can stop it. Amen? And so, now before he goes into telling us what are the characteristics of divine wisdom, he tells us of the negative because he wants us to avoid it, right? He says, okay, don't do this. Instead, pursue this. So he tells us of negative. And so we see here in verses uh, James 3 and verse 14 uh, through 16, he says, look, if you are being motivated by bitter envy, and selfish ambition, don't boast. And don't lie against the truth, meaning just own up. So what's motivating you? Two things he says we should avoid. Avoid self uh, uh, envy, jealousy, and self-seeking or selfish ambition. Self-driven, avoid that. Avoid jealousy. So guard your heart from jealousy. Let there not be an ounce of jealousy in you and in me. Amen? The moment you feel jealous of somebody, whoever, you know, somebody in your work, somebody in school, your neighbor, whoever, the moment you feel Jealous. The, the sense of feeling jealous begins to creep inside you. Say, so confess it to God. Because he says, don't lie against the truth. Own up. And the best to own up is God. Oh God, I felt jealous about that person. 
because they got one mark more than me. <laughs> or whatever, you know, you know whatever the, the, the thing is. God, I felt jealous about that person because whatever. Own it up. Own up before God. So God, please take it out of me. I don't want it in me. Let there be no ounce of jealousy, envy, jealousy. No ounce of jealousy in me. And second thing he says is self-seeking, selfish ambition. So two things he says, avoid. Why? Why are these two things so detrimental? He says in verse 15 now, if you have, so verse 14 he says, you know, do not boast, I don't lie. Because he says, verse 15, this wisdom is not from God. Meaning, what you do motivated out of jealousy, envy, jealousy, and selfish ambition. What you do when your plans, when your devices, when your thinking, when your strategies, whatever, when it is motivated out of jealousy and selfish ambition, that, he says, is not from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. Are you listening? For example, suppose we are a church, you know. Okay, how can we get more people to come to church? Ah, what is that church doing? Let's outdo them. Let's, you know. Hey, what are you motivated by? That's not the Holy Spirit. You're being motivated by envy and selfish ambition. Then that ministry strategy is not from God, but it's earthly, sensual, and demonic. Oh, that ministry strategy, that idea, that method, that operation, whatever you're doing, it's not from above. It's earthly, sensual, and why? Because it's motivated out of jealousy and selfish ambition. Are you listening? Yes or no? Yeah. So that's why it's so dangerous. He says, look, avoid these two things. Because that wisdom, whatever idea you come up with, strategy, it's not from God. It's earthly, sensual, demonic. And what will be the outcome? Next verse. If you read that verse, whew, the next verse he says, verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, and every evil thing are there. Where envy and self-seeking, who else is there? Mr. Confusion and every evil thing. The devil and all his wicked ones. Oh, I don't want anything to do with envy and self-seeking. Why? Because where there is envy and self-seeking, who are all the companions? Confusion and every evil thing. So you can imagine now, just think about this in various scenarios. You can think about it in church, you can think about it in ministry, you can think about it at home, home situations, you can think about it in the workplace situation, school situation, college. You know, think about this, this applies to anything and everything. When we do things that are motivated out of jealousy and self seeking, selfish ambition, we're opening the door for confusion. Sooner or later, confusions come in. Like, what is going on? Confusion. People confused. Things happen. Conf confusion. And every evil thing. It's like the devil comes in and has a heyday. That's why James is saying, to avoid these two things. Avoid being motivated by jealousy and selfish ambition. Avoid that. But instead, operate with divine wisdom. 
Now, in chapter 1, he's already told us how to get divine wisdom. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. So he's told us how to get it. Now he's telling us how to know that we're actually walking in divine wisdom. So he gives us eight characteristics or eight traits or eight expressions of divine wisdom. This is what you could say the litmus test. You can check to know whether you're walking in God's wisdom or not. How do, we do? How do you know? Because he says, verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above. So we prayed for wisdom. God has given. Let's see now how, whether you're walking in it or not. The wisdom from above, verse 17, is what? First, pure. So God in his wisdom is not going to show you and me how to rob the bank. That is not pure, honest, no integrity. The wisdom that comes from above is first pure, or you could use the word integrity or honest or you know, any synonyms uh, to the word pure, holy. So that's the first trait. Is the idea, is the strategy, is what you're deciding to do, is it pure? Is it holy? Is it clean? Is it honest? Is that integrity? If it's not, first test fails. So the wisdom from above is first pure. Second, he says, it's peaceable. That means it's promoting peace as opposed to confusion and strife and all. It's promoting peace. And it, it is peaceable. It is expressed in a peaceful way. Manner. So it's not coming forth as something controlling, dominates, not peaceable. Producing peace and expressed in a very peaceful manner. Third test, he says, is it's gentle, it's kind, it's considerate. Gentleness. And the psalmist said, your gentleness has made me great. Now think about it. That's totally counterintuitive again. Your gentleness has made me. Most people think if you're gentle, you'll become chapati. The psalmist said, your gentleness has made me great. You're not going to become... <laughs> See, the, the, the truths of scripture sometimes are so... Different from the ways of the world. Number four, it's willing to yield, meaning it's teachable. It's not insisting on its own way. Or like we have the phrase, my way, no way, or highway. <laughs> what do you want, you know? So he says, the wisdom from God is willing to yield, it's teachable. So you present and say, you know, see, I just feel that this is a good thing to do, but I just want to present it to you. I want to take it, take it. If you don't, fine. You don't, you know, start insisting this has to be the way. I heard from God. Gabriel met me last night. It's not like that. It's willing to yield. It's not insisting on its own way. What else we see? Number five. It's full of mercy, full of compassion. It's compassionate, merciful. It's as, con as opposed to taking revenge, as opposed to inflicting punishment. It's full of mercy. See, that's a characteristic of wisdom. I'm talking about divine wisdom. Number six, good fruits. The outcomes are good, wholesome, healthy. It's blessing people. It's not destructive in the outcome. Good fruits. Number seven, without partiality. It's not showing favoritism. It's not, uh, it's not an expression of somebody's prejudice. No. It's without 
impartially, it's fair, it's equitable, it's treating everybody equally, without partiality. And lastly, number eight, it's without hypocrisy, meaning it's sincere. No covering up, trying to please someone. No, without hypocrisy, sincere. This is genuine. It's coming from the heart. Eight characteristics of wisdom from God. So this is how you and I can tell that whatever we are planning, our, what are we seeking to do, or, you know, whether it's a strategy, an idea, whatever, whatever you're doing in life is actually coming from God above, is, is motivated from heavenly wisdom, or whether it's motivated from envy and selfish ambition, which actually is earthly, sensual, and demonic. And it's, if, if we take that route, it's going to open the door to confusion and every evil thing. And, you know, I, I, we could spend time looking at scenarios, but let me just say this, that this can be true even in a church. So even in the church context, if we are doing something, but we are motivated by uh, envy, jealousy, and selfish ambition, sooner or later you'll find a good thing is ending up in confusion and is actually being destructive. How did that happen? I thought we were serving God. I thought we were doing ministry. Yeah, you're doing ministry. But what was your motivation? What motivated this good thing? It was birthed out of envy and selfish ambition. Then, we are positioning ourselves for confusion and every evil work. So that's why you and I had to keep checking our hearts. God, what is motivating me? Why do I want to do it? It's not, the question is not what I want to do. The question is why? What is motivating? Are you listening? And so he says, you know, those who enjoy the fruits of righteousness, they are the ones who are sowing these things very peacefully. So you sow the seeds peacefully, you will enjoy the fruits. Amen? So, in your place of work, you see, initially when you walk by divine wisdom, the world doesn't understand this. They'll think, this fellow is very power. Sorry, I'm using <laughs> this fellow. He's walking with divine wisdom. You know, he's a pushover. Or he's, uh, he's somebody, you know, he's not going to survive in this, you know, hostile workplace. But what the Bible says is, when you sow these seeds, you will enjoy the fruits. Amen? While you're sowing the seeds, people will think, oh, what has happened? But you know, hey, I'm sowing seeds of divine wisdom. And those who sow the seeds of divine wisdom, they will enjoy the fruits of right. You're going to enjoy the fruit one day, or fruits one day. So now we go to chapter 4. I think we won't finish chapter 4 today. <laughs> anyway. So, let's read. We're going to pick up chapter 4. Uh, we'll look at the first five verses. Now, oh, let's try to finish it. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now, He's continuing from chapter 3. So James didn't write, you know, break it down in chapter and verse. He was actually writing a 
complete letter. So he has shown us what causes all this strife, confusion, and every evil work. And then he says, okay, there's one more thing we must be aware of. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? So can you imagine, this is among believers, and there are wars and fights. Amongst believers. So he's, he's addressing the church. So he says, believers, if you've got all this war and fighting, uh, strife and confusion and all these things going on, where does it come from? He says, you know, the root cause is, in verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, they come from your desire for pleasure or wrong desire, evil desire. So why is there fighting, strife, all those kinds of things, wars and fights among the people of God, between God's people? It says, because of evil desire, a desire for pleasures. Now remember, he's addressed desire for pleasure in chapter 1. Every man is tempted when he's drawn by his own desires. That's chapter 1. Now he's telling us another effect of wrong desire. So wrong desire not only puts us into temptation, wrong desire also puts us at war with one another. Are we understanding? So he says, where do these fights between all of you come? He says, it's by because of your own desire for pleasures. So because of these evil desires, verse 2, he says, we war, we fight. We lust, we hate, or we kill. And in the Bible, hating, uh, if you hate your brother, you're a murderer. So we are equating that. So you war, you fight, you're in strife, you, you desire, you, you hate. You all do all that, but you still don't have it. Why? Because we are doing it the way we're supposed to do it. If you want something, if you need something, you got to ask God. But instead, we are fighting with everybody else. So he says, you war and you fight, this is worse too. You lust and you do not have, you murder and covet and cannot obtain. Why? Because you do not ask. Instead of asking God, you're fighting with each other. But then when you go to ask God, verse 3, he says, you ask and still don't receive because you're asking motivated out of these evil desires. So even our asking is, motiv- is coming out of this wrong desire. So God is not obligated to give that to us. Then he says, verse 4, Now, this is probably one of the strongest rebukes given to believers. For believers to be called adulterers and adulteresses. You adulterer. Imagine James standing here and telling that to you and me. But he's straight on the face. He's calling believers. You adulterers and adulterers. Now, what, what does that mean? It means... Now, he's applying, of course, to spiritual things, but literally it means an adulterer has left his first love, broken his first covenant, and gone off with someone else. Now, that's how he's saying, applying it spiritually. So we've left our first love, we've left our covenant with God, and we've gone off pursuing friendship with the world. Why? Because of our evil desires, your desire for pleasures. He says, you're adulterers and adulteresses. Don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore is a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now, how how do we apply what he is saying? Or how do we apply this correctly? So part of, and in Bible college, we have a course called hermeneutics. Hermeneutics means interpreting scripture correctly. And part of interpreting scripture is you should never take scripture in isolation. You always interpret scripture in the light of the rest of scripture. It always you interpret it in the rest of what Genesis to Revelation says on the same subject. Another important part of interpreting scripture is to understand progressive revelation, meaning what has God said on the same subject over time? And you go with present truth, meaning you go with what he said, the most recent statement he made on the same subject. Are you with me? So that's how we have to interpret scripture. There are other guidelines as well. But what's he saying here? He's not saying you and I should not have no desires. 
what's he, what he's addressing is evil desires. Because Jesus taught us, whatever you desire when you pray. So you've got to have desire in things you're praying for. But here he's addressing evil desires. So he's identifying wrong desires as a root cause for all the fighting that's going on between believers. And even the, the evil desire as a cause for unanswered prayer. He's identifying that. So what's the antidote? Well, Jesus taught us this in John 15. He said, you know, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire. I think Ananya quoted that thing, I'm not sure. You will ask whatever you desire, and it will be given to you. So what's the antidote? The word of God. Because the word of God, if we are in the word, his word cleans us, cleanses us, purifies our desires. Jesus said, you are clean to the word that I have spoken to you. So his word purifies us, and then we are able to ask whatever we desire, and it will be given to us. So he's not saying don't have desires. He's saying don't have wrong desires. That's the point. We need to desire good things, the good things of God, the things that God has ordained for us, right? So don't use the saying, oh, don't have any desire. No. Let our desires be purified, washed clean by the word of God. Then we have good desires. We can go after those things. The second thing also, when he talks about friendship with the world, understand that we are in this world. We, we don't isolate ourselves from the world. We are here to be salt and light. We are here to make a difference. And Jesus prayed, you know, in what is referred to as his high priestly prayer in John 17. He said, Father, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. They are in the world, but they are not of the world. So, how do we understand this thing about friendship with the world and enmity with God? We are in the world, but our love for God still reigns supreme. We engage with the world meaningfully. We do things that are helpful to people and you know, that, that are meaningful in this world. We engage meaningfully. We're not afraid to engage with the world. But our love for God is still supreme. That's how we make sure we don't become friends with the world. We're in the world, we engage the world, but our love for God is supreme. Are you listening? Right? So, avoid evil desires. Let our desires be purified by the word of God. Then we can ask God what we desire and he will give it to us, John 15, 7. Second, how do we keep ourselves, you know, while we're engaging with the world, we, are not, don't, become, we don't befriend the world because our love for God is always supreme. It is much greater than our engagement with the world. Are you with me? And then keep this in mind. God is not against you enjoying the things he created. First Timothy 6.17 says, you know, says, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, you know, command those who are rich in the world that they don't become haughty, they don't become proud, but but put their trust in God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. So if you enjoy a masal dosa, go for it. You know, whatever it is, it's okay. God gives us richly all things to enjoy. enjoy. It's okay to enjoy. But your trust is always in God. Yeah? So don't say, oh, I read this chapter verse in James 4.4. 4. I, should, I should be a friend. friend and you delete all the numbers of all your friends. No, see, scripture must be understood in the light of the rest of scripture. Otherwise, you take one scripture and you do something silly. And then we all have to come to counsel you. <laughs> so, interpret scripture in the light of the rest of scripture. So, God's given us things to enjoy. Enjoy. But your love for God, your trust in God always remains intact. Because he says in that last verse that we read, verse 5, because 
Uh, don't, do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? That's verse five, James four, verse five. Now we don't exactly, it's not a singular verse that he's quoting, but he's, re- he's referencing the essence of what we see in the Old Testament, that God says, I am a jealous God and you are my peculiar people. So he's pro- most probably connecting the two and saying, you know, God who dwells in you, he's jealous of you. So we have one of those recent songs, he is jealous for me. Loves like a hurricane. What else? Something else. It goes on. Yeah. But God is jealous for you. He wants you for himself. That's why he doesn't want us to be friends with the world. He wants us to be friends with God. Are you with me? I can see the clock is looking at me and saying I'm 1229. And we've just gone through six verses or five verses of James 4. All right, I know we will not finish this, so worship team, please come. Please come. I'm making it difficult for the rest of our team because we try to keep all our locations in sync and re-central is out of sync. (laughs) They would have all finished chapter 4 and we've only done till verse (laughs) 5. So anyway, we'll, you know, we'll catch up. But here's what I want to, I felt, I know it's 12.30 already. If you need to leave, please feel free. But I'm going to take a few more minutes. Um, One of the things that we must understand as God's people is to live meaningful lives here on earth. Sometimes in our spiritual journey, in our desire to be spiritual, in our desire to pursue the things of God, we incorrectly assume that God wants us to disconnect from the world completely. That's not so. God's looking, like Jesus said in Luke 19, he's looking for people who will occupy till I come. Or literally it can be translated, do business till I come. Engage the world meaningfully till he comes. Are you listening? So I feel I need to impress that in these concluding remarks here this morning. And I want to speak, especially speak to those of you who are students, those who are in college, those of you who are in the workplace, I believe that we are in a time where there is a heavenly mandate on people in the world, God's people in the world. That means you are anointed to be there. You're anointed to be in the world as God's representative. Now, there will be some people whom God calls out into what we call as full-time ministry. But I'm speaking to the rest of us who are not in quote-unquote full-time ministry, but we're in the marketplace. But I want to impress on you this morning that God is saying there's a mandate on you. There's an anointing on you to be there. There's an assignment for your life in the marketplace, in the world, whatever you're doing. You could be a sports person, you could be a businessman, you could be a graphics designer, you could be an artist, you could be politician. I don't know, there's so many things we can do. But there's a mandate, heaven's mandate on your life. There's an anointing on your life in that place. So don't look at yourself as a second class believer. Oh, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a prophet, I'm not an apostle. There's no second class believers. We're all believers. We're all children of God. And we are all anointed by the same Holy Spirit. Just that our assignments are different. Each one has a different assignment and you have an assignment in the world, in the marketplace. I didn't know this when I was young, 
My dad can testify. I thought when I was a teenager, I thought I had to leave everything and be a full-time minister. But thank God, you know, in those early teenage years, God directed my paths and I went to engineering college, studied, but I always had a dream. I said, God, I want to start a business. I want to start something that will use technology to serve your kingdom. I didn't know how it was going to come out. But I still remember some letters my dad wrote. He said, son, explore the frontiers of knowledge. And I took that seriously. I said, you know, I've got to learn. And then I want to be an engineer. And I want to do something where that will glorify God through engineering. So then I went to my master's in biomedical engineering because I wanted to integrate technology and medicine. I did that. And then eventually, things I'm in skipping a lot of things, but started this software company uh, after coming back to India while we were pioneering the church, doing this company. It was tough. It was those 14 years were difficult. But we started developing systems, healthcare systems. That was part of what we did. Some, some people here on the East, they were working in the same company. So we, we were building healthcare systems. We did for the North American market and saw this. But one of the things, privilege we had was to build, you know, what is called, a, some of you may understand it, some of you don't understand it, but it's a radiology uh, uh, picture archiving, picture image management system for one of the largest hospitals in India or, say, Asia. It's one of our privileges to do that. And that system is still running today. And they've extended now. They've added, like, I don't know about, I don't know how many departments have come on uh, in managing medical images. And uh, they've bought a new, they're setting up a new campus and they're going to use the software we built, the system we built, even in the new campus, giving preference to commercially available systems. And so I'm looking back and saying, God, you know, that's one of the, you know, flagship projects we did, products we built. I'm saying, God, thank you for the opportunity to contribute meaningfully to people's lives. You know, it's been a while since I've come out and just doing ministry, but that product that we built is still being used in one of the largest hospitals in Asia to manage the medical images of thousands of patients who come in. And it's being extended and being used uh, in their new, it's going to be used in the new thing. The reason I, I'm sharing that with you is I want to challenge each of us. Say, God, we want to live meaningfully here on earth. Just because you're a believer, just because you love Jesus, doesn't mean you're of no earthly use. Are you listening? live such a life saying, God, I am a believer, but I want to do something here on earth that will be meaningful, that will contribute to life here on earth, society, whatever, and let that be your witness for Jesus Christ. But there's an anointing on you to do it. Are you listening? So that's the challenge, I feel. I mean, this, I was going to do this at the end of chapter 4, but we didn't get to the end of chapter 4. But, but I just feel I should release this to you today. So let's stand to our feet. Please. Father, I pray that every believer, God, every believer, will live meaningful lives here on earth. Will make meaningful and useful contributions to society. Whatever sphere they're engaged in, God, whether they are in business, technology, whether they are in art or entertainment or media or education or whatever sphere that you've anointed them and gifted them 
may they make meaningful contributions to this world to life on earth and let that be a testimony because jesus said let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven let them see your good works let them see what you can do in your industry let them see what you can contribute in your sphere of influence let them see the wisdom of god emanating through your life like the psalmist prayed let pray let the beauty of the lord our god be seen upon us let the splendor of his wisdom let the splendor of his magnificence let the beauty of his glory be expressed through your life whatever you do whether you're a school teacher let the wisdom of god shine through in your classroom whether you're a businessman a scientist an entrepreneur a doctor whatever let the beauty of the lord our god be seen upon the works you do because there's a mandate from god on you right there there's an anointing of the holy spirit upon you right there and like the psalmist prayed prayed lord establish thou the work of our hands establish the work of the hands of your people father whatever they may be doing whatever sphere that they may be engaged in lord establish the work that they do make it strong make it successful make it fruitful let it have impact for your kingdom let it bring forth heaven's influence on the earth let the glory of the lord our god shine through the works that they do father that people will see the good works that come through their lives and glorify the father who is in heaven oh lord do this through your people our father we pray that you'll awaken us to the mandate and the anointing that's resting on each person's life that we have heaven's mandate on us and we have god's anointing upon us in whatever we are called to do and so lord use each one of your people to push back the powers of darkness use each one of your people god wherever you place them to advance the kingdom of god and the powers of darkness recede and take many steps back as these god anointed men and women enter their spheres of influence do this father we pray we thank you we bless you father we thank you god so be glorified so be glorified so be glorified thank you lord thank you lord we're going to sing a simple song in my life lord be glorified we haven't sung it for a long time pastor roshan can we sing it and i put you on the spot in your church lord be glorified make this your prayer please make this your prayer
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit.
continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, and books, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, visit apcbiblecollege.org. Do remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the Apple or Google Play Store.